last lecture, I told you how to add angular momenta. And uh, so, we demonstrated how to start with two spin half objects for instance and uh, add them to get coupled states which are either spin triplet states or a spin singlet state. So, we will continue with addition of angular momenta. And yesterday we worked with j 1 equals half in units of h cross j 2 equals half and this gave us coupled states the spin triplet state uh, by spin triplet I mean j is 1 the third component m is 1 j is 1 m is 0 and j is 1 m is minus 1. This is the triplet state of angular momentum and if indeed by j 1 and j 2 we mean spin then it is the spin triplet state and we can have a spin singlet state as well that is just one state with j equals 0 and therefore m equals 0. We also learned how to write this coupled state coupled basis states in terms of the uncoupled set and we had the following. Suppose my notation is j 1, j 2, j m for the coupled basis, j 1 and j 2 are anyway fixed as half and half, j is 1 and m is 1. Now, this state can be written in terms of the uncoupled basis states. The uncoupled basis states are represented by j 1, m 1 j 2 m 2 and I would not use a double braces for that just to show you that this is the uncoupled basis set. So, this would be half if I want m equals 1 then this should have come from m 1 equals half and m 2 equals half. So, this is an example of the uncoupled basis set and indeed we would have gotten this coupled basis state in terms of the uncoupled basis state by using half comma half for j 1 and m 1 and half comma half for j 2 and m 2. We wrote it in compact notation and I simply said that 1 comma 1 the first entry being j the second entry being m was simply half 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 half. 1 comma 0 had a combination I could have started with m 1 equals half and m 2 equals minus half or the other way around and we showed that this was 1 by root 2 half 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 minus half plus half minus half half half. So, this was 1 comma 0 and 1 comma minus 1 was another stretched case which simply came from m 1 equals minus half and m 2 equals minus half. There was the other state which was the spin singlet state. This is j and that is m. The states that contributed to the spin singlet state, the states that were superposed in order to get the spin singlet state were precisely these states except that the combination was different and we got to a point where we said that we could write this in the following fashion. Minus of half minus half half half. So, this is what we had. There is a relative negative sign and that is what is important. I could have started with this having a negative sign and that state coming with a positive sign in front of it. It would not have mattered. I stick to a convention and keep that during a particular exercise or when I work out a single problem I stick to a certain convention. The convention will be best demonstrated when I do more examples. Um, I want to comment a little bit about uh, the importance of the results that we have got. 
The best way in my opinion to understand this is by looking at the world of elementary particles. So, elementary particles are labeled by quantum numbers. In other words, they are represented by states in an appropriate linear vector space. The state labels are various quantum numbers corresponding to the elementary particles. Examples of elementary particles of course, could be protons, neutrons, and the pions, the charged pions and the neutral pions, the kaons, the charged kaons and the neutral kaons. By that I mean um, the deltas, some of them, one of them is neutral and the others carry electric charge and so on. In fact, there is a, a wide uh, variety of particles. And depending upon the spin of the particle, the spin quantum number of the particle, particles are classified as fermions and bosons. Fermions are particles which have spin half in units of h cross, half integer spin. In units of h cross. So, examples are protons and neutrons, um, electrons. Uh, these come with uh, little s equals half. S z of course, could be or m could be plus half or minus half, that is ok. And then um, you have objects like the deltas. Now, these have s equals 3 by 2 in units of h cross. So, these are spin 3 by 2 particles, examples of spin 3 by 2 particles. Then there is pi plus the pi ons, pi 0 and pi minus. The suffix denotes the electric charge. These are examples of uh, and there are many more particles, but these are examples of spin 0 objects. So, they are bosons. Bosons have 0 or integer spin and fermions have half integer spins. So, spin is a quantum number which certainly is uh, important in uh, representing the particle. Now, apart from spin, there is another quantum number called isospin. And this is very relevant particularly in the context of particles which can uh, interact strongly with each other or decay strongly. Um, the nuclear force is an example of a strong force. So, examples of objects that can interact strongly are protons, neutrons, um, not the electrons, the deltas, that is delta plus plus, delta plus, delta 0, delta minus, of course, pi plus, pi 0, pi minus. All these and many more are examples of strongly interacting particles and strongly interacting particles are called hadrons. I want to emphasize that hadrons interact strongly and can also interact electromagnetically or weakly as the case may be. Uh, the definition is simply that these particles are capable of interacting strongly. They could have electromagnetic interactions or weak interactions, may or may not have it, that is not the issue. The point is hadrons are particles which are capable of strong interactions. These are examples of such particles. If you look at the proton and the neutron, so I am going to look at some of the hadrons. If you look at the proton and the neutron for instance, of course, this carries a charge plus E and this has 0 electric charge, it is electrically neutral that is certainly a difference between the proton and the neutron. But if you look at the other quantum numbers, both of them have spin half h cross. If you look at their rest mass, that is approximately 938 million electron volts by c squared. It is conventional in particle physics and uh, um, very useful to talk in terms of energy units. And therefore, if I convert the rest mass into energy, by multiplying the rest mass by c squared, I get energy 938 MeV approximately. There are other quantum numbers uh, which I need not introduce now, 
such as the baryon number, strangeness and so on, it turns out that the proton and the neutron have the same values for these quantum numbers. And so, I would like to look at it in the following fashion. Of course, I can see the difference between the charge, electric charge of the proton and the neutron, if I turn on the electromagnetic field, uh, because the charged particle deflects in the presence of an electromagnetic field. In other words, it interacts with the field quanta, the photon, and um, exchanges momentum and energy with it, and deflects in its track. Uh, a neutron does not do that, because it is electrically neutral. But suppose I did not switch on the electromagnetic field at all. If I were only considering a world of strong interactions, and not anything else, not the electromagnetic force, or m a relatively negligible forces like the weak force and the gravitational force. Suppose I did not consider any of that. In a world of strong interactions, the, there is no way of seeing the difference between a proton and a neutron, because I cannot see the difference in their charge, electric charge, since I am not using the electromagnetic field at all, not switching it on. In other words, I am not considering the fact that the proton can interact electromagnetically uh, with itself. For instance, uh, two protons can interact electromagnetically, and two neutrons cannot. A neutron cannot interact electromagnetically with a proton. Suppose I did not talk about electromagnetism. I cannot see the difference between the proton and the neutron, because all other quantum numbers are the same, and the rest masses are approximately the same. <coughs> now, you could always tell me that I can see the difference in the rest mass. I could, but now it is uh, known that this difference, this small difference in the rest mass of the two particles, really arises from the fact that the protons can interact electromagnetically, and the neutrons cannot. Therefore, if I switch off the electromagnetic field, I do not see the difference between the proton and the neutron. I could think of them as two states of a single object called the nucleon. I could think of the proton and the neutron in a world of strong interactions only as a doublet, the nucleon doublet, the proton being one of the states of the nucleon and the neutron being the other state of the nucleon. And then it turns out that there is a new quantum number, which can be associated with these objects, and that is called isospin. To distinguish it from the spin that I have been talking about, or orbital angular momentum, and a third component of isospin, you could call that I z or I 3, and that is the analog of m s comma m. So, I could label the proton and the neutron as a doublet uh, with a certain value of i and i z. This is another value of i and i z. These are the isospin states of the proton and the neutron. I would give entries i and i z for the proton and the neutron. Isospin is analogous to spin in the sense that there are three generators, three Hermitian generators of isospin. I would call them I x, I y, and I z. These are Hermitian operators, and they satisfy the isospin algebra, which is the same as spin. And therefore, it follows that all that I said about spin or angular momentum can be now told in the context of isospin, simply replacing j by i, which means j x by i x, j y by i y, and j z by i z. Little j by little i, because i squared acting on a state i i z is i times i plus 1 i i z, and i z, the operator i z acting on a state with labels little i and little i z. Give me this. It is evident that i squared and i z commute with each other, and that is why I am able to do this. Now, getting to this, 
like a spin doublet, I could treat the proton and the neutron, since there are only two states of the nucleon, I could treat the proton and the neutron as an isospin doublet, the proton being in the i is equal to half and i 3 equals half state, the neutron also being in the i is equal to half and i 3 equals minus half state. This is analogous to the spin doublet. You could think of the electron in the up state as a spin half m equals half state of the electron and the electron in the down state as an s is equal to half m equals minus half state of the electron. Similarly, I talk of an i equals half i z equals plus half state and an i equals half i z equals minus half state. Of the nucleon, the half comma half state is the proton and the half comma minus half state is the neutron. It is not merely the protons and the neutrons that form isomultiplets. It turns out that all hadrons form isomultiplets. These objects delta plus plus, delta plus, delta 0, delta minus happen to be an isoquartet. In other words, they are four states, they are a set of four objects that transform as an isomultiplet. So, it is they transform analogous to a spin 3 by 2 object. This would be an i equals 3 by 2, i z equals 3 by 2. This is an i equals 3 by 2, i z equals half state. This is an i equals 3 by 2, i z equals minus half state. And this is an i equals 3 by 2, i z equals minus 3 by 2 state. So, I have an isoquartet and therefore, i is fixed. It is a, it's a, it's a, it's a single multiplet um, where i suspend is 3 by 2 and i z takes values minus i to plus i in steps of 1. Now, if you look at the pi plus pi 0 pi minus, they transform as a triplet under isospin. So, indeed I have pi plus which is the i equals 1 i z equals 1 state, pi 0 i equals 1 i z equals 0 state and pi minus which is i equals 1 i z equals minus 1 state. Isospin and i z are two labels like the charge or like the spin of a particle. Uh, they are quantum numbers corresponding to a particle and two particles will differ at least in one quantum number. These are just examples of quantum numbers which label particle states. In any case that was a digression, but in the context of what I have done here, I could think of this whole exercise as being done in the context of combining two isospin equals half object objects. In other words, I could think of this as i 1 the isospin of the first particle and that as i 2 the isospin of the second particle. As I said this is possible because isospin follows the same algebra as angular momentum, or orbital angular momentum or spin and therefore, I simply have to replace j by i j z by i z and carry on for bookkeeping purposes. So, returning to this problem, I have the following situation. Suppose I had two beams interacting strongly, one is uh, two beams of nucleons. <coughs> so, beam 1 has protons and neutrons, beam 2 has protons and neutrons. Now, when I look at it as a couple system, as, as, a, as a composite system of two nucleons. Of course, if I think of them as protons and neutrons, the proton state is half comma half as I have just now explained. The neutron state is half comma minus half. <coughs> this is the uncoupled situation where I think of them as independent subsystems, but I could think of two protons one from beam 1 and the other from beam 2. Now, if I did that, it would be represented by half half with half half. This is beam 1 and this is beam 2. If you wish, you could call this beam A and that as beam B. Now, I could think of two neutrons and that would be a half minus half 
with a half minus half. These are basis states in the uncoupled basis. Of course, I would use my shorthand notation and just call this half comma half semicolon half comma half. So, that will be like i i z i 1 i 1 z i 2 i 2 z and so on. So, that is analogous to j 1 m 1 j 2 m 2, but I could think of them as a coupled state. So, for instance, I can have protons from the first beam interacting with protons from the second beam that is the initial state to give me a final state of two protons. So, the possibilities are the following. The question to be asked is how do I couple two i equals half objects and what is the coupled state. As you know the coupled states are 1 1. So, this is i i z in the coupled basis that is my notation uh, because I am not able to put it in bold uh, as a bold ket and therefore, I do this. So, the uncoupled basis states would be half 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 minus half 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 half, but that is like combining two protons and therefore, this would just be identical to the statement that I in the uncoupled basis I have two protons in the coupled basis that amounts to an i equals 1 i z equals 1 state. Then I have i equals 1 i z equals minus 1 state in the coupled basis. This should have come by working with i 1 z equals minus half i 2 z equals minus half because I could have got i z the z component in the coupled basis to be minus 1 only if I had a minus half here and a minus half there. This is simply analogous to m equals m 1 plus m 2 and that is like saying that I have combined two neutrons. So, I could have written this, but I can also have a situation where I can have i equals 1 with i z equals 0 and that could have come by taking a proton from the first beam combining it with a neutron from the second beam or by taking a neutron from the first beam and combining it with a proton from the second beam and this is my notation. This is for the first beam, second beam, first beam, second beam, but these are different states because this is a times half 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 minus half plus b multiplying half minus half half half, but we had worked out these cg coefficients earlier and we know that 1 0 is simply 1 by root 2 n p plus p n. The singlet state 0 0 is orthogonal to the state and we could have written that. And we showed that this is 1 by root 2 n p minus p n. In the language of protons and neutrons and isospin, this is what it is. Earlier on, I had written it in terms of j and m in the following manner. So, if I call this i and I call that i z, that is a proton neutron minus neutron proton. Well, I have written neutron proton minus proton neutron here, but as I said, it is the relative sign that is important and I have uh, pulled out a 1 by root 2 and put in a relative negative sign. So, this is the singlet state of isospin and these are the triplet states of isospin. Now, given these, I ask the following question. Suppose, I look at the process proton proton interacting strongly to produce two protons. Experimentally, what the experimenter observes in the laboratory is the cross section for this process. The scattering cross section for two protons interacting to produce two protons strongly. Now, if that is what I was looking at, I compute the scattering cross section in two stages 
first of all there is a scattering amplitude which I will denote by s initial state to final state this is an operator it depends upon the interaction Hamiltonian I could just call it s f i. So, this is an operator and this is the matrix element which takes it from an initial state to a final state. So, in this context I have the scattering amplitude for p p going to p p and that is the same in my notation as this object. In other words I have to find out what is the probability that if I started with the combination 1 comma 1 I end up with the same combination after the interaction I get 1 comma 1. Want to denote this by s 1 comma 1 1 comma 1 that is what I put on there. The scattering cross section is essentially apart from some constant factors which would not change for all these processes because it is based on kinematics, it is based on the phase space available, it is based on the energy and the momentum available and that does not change apart from this overall constant. This is modulus of s 1 comma 1 the whole square this is a matter of uh, um, derivation, but we will take this as a definition and this is what is measured experimentally the scattering cross section is measured experimentally. This is like a, an amplitude which mod squares to give me the cross section it is the probability that two protons interact with each other to produce two protons. Similarly, I can ask what is the probability that if I prepare a state very carefully an initial state very carefully with i equals 1 i z equals 0 what is the probability of starting with that initial state and ending with that same initial state. In other words what is the scattering amplitude for a state which is prepared very carefully as n p plus p n by root 2 going to a final state which is also given as n p plus p n by root 2. So, sigma for this process the scattering cross section for an initial state carefully prepared as n p plus p n by root 2 going to n p plus p n by root 2 is essentially x s 1 comma 0 mod square. Similarly, sigma n n going to n n and now the notation is evident an initial state of 2 neutrons going to a final state of 2 neutrons is s 1 comma minus 1 the whole square. Now, I could have prepared it in the state ket n p by root 2 minus ket p n by root 2 which is what I have there. So, the probability s um, n p minus p n by root 2 going to itself this mod square apart from a constant factor is sigma n p minus p n ket by root 2 going to n p minus p n by root 2 and this is what I have these are the various possibilities that I have <coughs> assuming that strong interactions conserve isospin and iz. So, I will not for instance ask what is the probability that 1 comma 1 goes to 1 comma 0 because in strong interactions uh, iz is conserved which means that the initial states iz value is equal to the final states iz value. Similarly, the initial states isospin value is equal to the final states isospin value and therefore, there is nothing like 1 comma 1 going to 1 comma 0 the labels have to be the same in both cases. So, these are the only possibilities. Now, I find something interesting I know that I cannot see the difference between the proton and the neutron this is an i equals half i z equals half this is an i equals half i z equals minus half 
in a world of strong interactions. So, given an isomultiplet, that means once you fix i, changing i z in steps of 1 takes you to various particles within that same multiplet and with strong interactions alone, I cannot see the difference between the various particles that belong to the same isomultiplet. Obviously, therefore, I cannot see the difference between 1 comma minus 1, 1 comma 0 and 1 comma 1, because these are all states with the same isospin value made of the same set of particles, nucleons, two nucleon system with i equals 1, but the i z value changing. And therefore, I will use a shorthand notation. I will drop the third component, because it does not matter. Cannot see the difference between the coupled state 1 comma 0, 1 comma minus 1 and 1 comma 1. And therefore, the cross section can be now written in the following manner. Sigma p p going to p p is an overall constant s 1 mod squared. This one stands for i equals 1. Sigma n n going to n n. It's the same s, s 1 mod squared. The only difference being that this is the um, 1 comma minus 1 state, but as I said the second index does not matter within an isomultiplet and sigma n p plus p n by root 2, which is the i equals 1 combination going to itself But clearly, this is in general not equal to 1 comma 0 comma 0, because this is a different isospin valued object. This is an iso singlet and that is part of the same iso triplet. What does that mean? It means the following. <coughs> the cross section or the probability of two protons in the initial state interacting strongly to produce two protons this probability <coughs> or the cross section for p p going to p p is the same is equal to the cross section for two neutrons interacting to produce two neutrons. And indeed is the same for a neutron from the first beam and a proton from the second beam, a proton from the first beam and a neutron from the second beam taken and prepared very carefully in the isospin 1 state that is as part of the isotriplet going to itself. So, these cross sections are the same and that is not the same in general as the cross section for the iso singlet going to itself. So, if you prepare the state combining a neutron and a proton as n p plus p n by root 2 going to itself, that cross section is the same as the cross section for p p going to p p or n n going to n n. But if you prepared this combination in the antisymmetric state n p minus p n by root 2. By antisymmetric I mean that if you interchange the neutron with the proton, you pick up an overall negative sign. A symmetric one means that you pick up an overall positive sign as happens here. So, if you prepare it in the antisymmetric state or in the iso singlet state, the cross section is not the same as these. This is popularly called charge independence of nuclear forces because nuclear forces as I told you is an example of the strong force. So, charge independence of nuclear forces simply means the following. It is irrelevant whether you take neutrons or protons. The fact that the proton is electrically charged and the neutron is electrically neutral does not matter. Provided you prepare uh, the two nucleon system in the same isospin state that means in the i equals 1 state or the isotriplet state, then the cross sections are the same. The only difference that can be seen in the laboratory is because of this, because when uh, a neutron interacts with a proton, it could be either in the i equals 1 state or in the i equals 0 state. And the small difference between these values, between this and that comes because of uh, uh, this extra piece which makes a contribution in neutron-proton interactions. 
this has been experimentally verified and is popularly it goes under the name charge independence of nuclear forces. So, nuclear forces are charge independent provided we are talking about the same isospin state I equals 1 or isotriplet. In the isotriplet state, I find that these cross sections are the same and that is not the same as the cross section for the isosinglet going to itself. So, this is a very uh, important and uh, useful experimentally verified example of addition of angular momenta, uh, except that I have also used this opportunity to introduce uh, a new quantum number isospin. It is very important in strong physics, strong interaction physics and uh, is a important quantum number i and i z are important quantum numbers which label particles that interact strongly hadrons. Now, having demonstrated this, I will go ahead and illustrate <coughs> addition of angular momenta in um, more detail by conducting the following exercise. I will now combine a j equals 1 state with a j equals half state. In other words, the exercise is the following j 1 is 1, j 2 is half. So, we are going to combine these two objects. So, j takes values 1 plus half to 1 minus half in steps of 1. So, j takes values 3 by 2 and half. <coughs> Corresponding to j equals 3 by 2, m can take various values. So, let me write all the coupled states j equals 3 by 2. So, m can be 3 by 2, but m can be half it goes down in steps of 1, m can be minus half and m can be minus 3 by 2. And if j equals half, m can be half, m can be minus half. So, these are the various coupled states that are possible in this context. <coughs> What about the uncoupled basis set? So, this is the coupled basis set. Now, the uncoupled basis that is J 1 M 1 J 2 M 2. I have half half combining with 1. So, perhaps I could I could write 1 1 combining with half half 1 1 combining with half minus half then 1 0 combining with half half 1 0 combining with half minus half 1 minus 1 combining with half half and 1 minus 1 combining with half minus half. So, the labels are clear that is j 1 m 1 j 2 m 2 that is what I have. So, I have the following 6 states uh, you will recall that that is 2 j 1 plus 1 times 2 j 2 plus 1 states therefore, 6 states and here too I have 6 states that is 4 of them here this is uh, a, a, a j equals 3 by 2 quartet this is a j equals half doublet and therefore, I have 6 states. So, the number of basis states match and this is a very important thing to verify when one does a calculation. So, I would like to find the C g coefficients in this context by expanding the coupled states in terms of the uncoupled basis. So, let us start with 3 by 2 3 by 2. Remember that this really amounts to j 1 uh, is 1, j 2 is half, j is 3 by 2 and m is 3 by 2, but I am dropping j 1 and j 2 and just using j and m as the labels for the coupled state. <coughs> but 3 by 2, 3 by 2 could have come only in the following fashion, it is a stretched case, 
because if I want m equals 3 by 2, then m 1 should have been 1 and m 2 should have been half. The only possibility is for m 1 as you can see are 1, 0 and minus 1 and for m 2 are half and minus half. So, I just have 1 comma 1 with half comma half and this is the uncoupled basis and therefore, I do this. This is j 1 m 1 j 2 m 2. Of course, by this I mean the following j 1 m 1 j 2 m 2, but I am going to use this as a simple uh, uh, way of writing it. So, this is a stretch case there is no other way I could have got uh, uh, 3 by 2 3 by 2 and therefore, the C g coefficient is 1 and that is a stretch case. Similarly, 3 by 2 minus 3 by 2 should have come by combining m 1 equals minus 1 with m 2 equals minus half. So, while j 1 and j 2 are fixed m 1 and m 2 are now minus 1 and minus half that is the only way I could have got 3 by 2 minus 3 by 2 therefore, that is a stretch case. I need to find 3 by 2 half. And as I pointed out yesterday, I can do this by using j minus here, correspondingly j 1 minus and j 2 minus there. I need to remember the following, j minus acts on a state j m to give me root of j plus m times j minus m plus 1, I have set h cross equals 1, j comma m minus 1 and j plus acts on j m to give me root of j minus m times j plus m plus 1 j m plus 1. These are the lowering and raising operators respectively. So, I use that and therefore, when I use j minus here the coefficient is root 3 where I have used j is 3 by 2 and m is 3 by 2. <coughs> Here j 1 minus acts on this leaving that alone pulls out a coefficient j 1 plus m 1 times j 1 minus m 1 plus 1 reduces m 1 to 0 leaves j 2 and m 2 as such. j 2 minus acts on this and leaves this alone. So, j 1 and m 1 do not change and I pick up a coefficient root of j 2 plus m 2 times j 2 minus m 2 plus 1 and m 2 gets reduced by 1. So, I have this. In other words, I can write 3 by 2 half as the state root of 2 thirds 1 0 half half plus root of 1 thirds 1 1 half minus half. So, this is what I have. I need to get the state 3 by 2 minus half in terms of the uncoupled basis. Uh, it is worth pointing out that the mod square of the C g coefficient sum together gives me unity that is a 2 thirds plus 1 thirds and this is a thing that needs to be checked out. Further, if I want a half here, that is a 0 plus half, and that is a 1 minus half. Right. These are things that should be checked out at various stages. So, if I want to do 3 by 2 minus half, I can use j minus on this. Well, there are two terms and a little bit more work to be done. I could have done a j plus on this, that is just one term on which I need to work. So, if I use a j plus, I remember that the coefficient here is j minus m times j plus m plus 1. So, I have this and here I use j 1 plus which is a j minus m times j plus m plus 1 takes 1 comma minus 1 to 1 comma 0 <coughs> and leaves the other state as such. Then I have j 2 minus acting j 2 plus acting on this it leaves 1 comma minus 1 alone 
and pulls out half plus half times half minus half plus 1 and then takes minus half to plus half. In other words, 3 by 2 minus half is root 2 thirds times this plus root 1 thirds times the other state. So, I can write this as root of 2 by 3 plus root of 1 by 3. Once more, it is clear that things add up um, root 2 thirds square plus root 1 third square is 1. So, I have the various states here. These are the stretched cases and then I got these by using j minus and j plus. So, I have already written these four states in terms of the uncoupled basis. I need to find half comma half and half comma minus half. Now, I do the following. Consider the state half comma half. This is j and that is m. Half comma half is like 3 by 2 comma half in the sense it has the same uncoupled states contributing to it. There is 0 plus half and a 1 minus half, but the coefficients would be different. So, I write half comma half as a times 1 comma 0 half comma half plus b that is the coefficient and I have 1 comma 1 half comma minus half. Given the fact that a squared plus b squared is 1, I need to determine these cg coefficients. This is easily done because this is one equation. The other equation is this 3 by 2 half is orthogonal to half half. Of course, all these states are orthogonal to half comma half, but what is of relevance is the fact that 3 by 2 half is orthogonal to half half because in the uncoupled basis they are superpositions of the same states and this implies <coughs> that root of 2 by 3 a plus root of 1 by 3 b equals 0 or uh, <coughs> b is minus root 2 a. So, I can use that and so I have a squared <coughs> plus b squared and that gives me a 2 a squared. So, I have 3 a squared equals 1 which gives me a is plus or minus 1 by root 3 which tells me that b is minus or plus root of 2 by 3. This is where I can use the convention. I am going to look at the second state and look at the m values. Well, this has a higher value compared to that. So, my convention is to put a positive sign here and a negative sign there. I, I stick to this convention throughout the problem. So, I have half comma half is minus 1 by root 3, 1 0 half half plus root of 2 3 2 by 3, 1 1 half minus half. Again, the mod squares when summed over add to 1, that is a 1 thirds plus a 2 thirds which gives me a 1 and uh, that is what I have for half comma half. I could have written plus 1 by root 3 here and a minus root of 2 by 3 there. As I said, I have used this convention. We can get half comma minus half in two ways. We can use the fact that half comma minus half is orthogonal to 3 by 2 comma minus half and repeat the procedure or can use a j minus on this and get half comma minus half. So, that gives me a 1 <coughs> half comma minus half minus 1 by root 3 is fixed j 1 minus acts on this leaving this alone plus j 2 minus acts on that leaving this alone. Similarly, plus root of 2 by 3 j 1 minus acting on this leaving that alone and j 2 minus acting on that leaving this alone. And once that is done, we have the state half comma minus half which can be simply found out. That is one way of doing it. As I said, the other way is to use the fact that half comma minus half is orthogonal to 3 by 2 comma minus half and find out the coefficients, which too can be done. But remember the convention, I compare the second entries 
and if m 2 there is smaller than m 2 here that comes with a positive sign and this comes with a negative sign. I stick to that convention during the problem. I leave it to you to complete this exercise.